2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to begin by reading the entire chapter. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you is believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking today about the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord. In Psalm chapter 114, verse 7, it says, Tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. Psalm 97, verse 5, The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. Psalm 68, and verse 8, The earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God the God of Israel. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 21, Moses, when he gave witness to the opportunity that he had to go into the mount that burned with fire at the presence of God, and he met with him there, receiving the tables of stone, the commandments written thereon with the finger of God, Moses declared, so terrible was the sight, I exceedingly fear and quake. In each one of our lives, the presence of the Lord should cause great and instant introspection. When we stand before God, we need to be introspect, not circumspect, right? Our lives should be walked circumspectly, walking around us, looking around us, watching for the things that could come upon us, happen upon us in a moment of time. But when we stand before God, the only inspection, the only inspection, the sight that should come to your mind is your own wretchedness before him. You should be revealed in your own self that you are short, that you are not worthy, that you are not as you seemeth to be, as you think you are in his sight. And like so many saints before us, fall to the ground as in heap, mourning in dust and ashes, at his feet as dead is the proper position of a humbled heart before the glory of God. And even those that are proud will be abased at the very presence of the Lord God Almighty, the Lord God of Jacob, the Lord God of Israel. When we stand before him, nobody will be proud. All will be abased. In the presence of the Lord, as we read about in, in Revelation, we find his eyes like as to a flame of fire burn. When we are seen by him, Every wickedness of our heart, every desire that is not righteous, every contemptuous idea or thought within us, every sin that we have passed before and will do after is open before him. The word of God, through the voice of God, cuts, it tries, it judges, and when we're in his presence, God forbid, it even condemns. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, the Bible says, The time is come that judgment must begin at the house 
of God. And if it first begin with us, what is or what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Standing before God, there's nothing going to be saved about us. The only thing that we can have before God is if he would extend his mercy and allow for us to live. Essentially, the presence of the Lord is going to come upon the whole world. And God here describes it as first coming upon us. And we need to be ready to be judged. We need to be ready to be tried. We need to be ready to be cut by the very words of God as they come upon us. And if the end of us is such that we are as dust and ashes, we are at our feet, at his feet rather, as dead, what then shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? What then shall be the end of them that are ungodly, that are not saved, that are sinners before him? The end is destruction. First Th or Second Thessalonians, as we were, in verse 8 there in chapter 1 says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And his presence is where his mighty, fiery vengeance will come upon those that obey not the gospel, those that have not believed on Christ, those that are not righteous before him but stand as condemned ungodly sinners. Now, unless we should think that this flaming fire that comes upon them is something they're removed from. I've often heard it said that hell is a separation from God. And they'll use this statement where it says, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Let me show you a few pages that affirm that it's not that it is away from the presence of the Lord that the burning comes from, but rather it's because of the presence of the Lord that the burning comes. Go to Revelation chapter 15 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 8. We saw the phraseology was that they were punished from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. In Revelation chapter 15 and verse 8 it says, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. The same verbiage is given here. It says that the temple is filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. Now we wouldn't think for a moment that the temple is filled with the smoke because it's separated from God. No, it's because God entered in. And when he did, the smoke was a direct result of his glory. The direct result of his power. And it was such that no man was able to enter in or even minister before the presence of God. And one more verse to just firm it up. That in God's presence is the fiery destruction due to those that will receive it. Look over in chapter 14 and verse 9. It says, And the third angel followed them with a loud voice, saying, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lord. The destruction, the measure of his wrath poured out without mixture, the cup of his indignation coming upon those that receive his mark will be received of them in the very presence of God and in the very presence of the holy angels that he has. God is everywhere. The Bible is clear. God is everywhere. Just ask Jonah. He thought that he could flee from the presence of God, but God wasn't tricked. God wasn't duped. God didn't go and seek and search out for him. He will communicate to us as if he doesn't know where we're at, as he did towards Adam. Adam, where art thou in his sins? But God is everywhere. Psalm 139 verse 8 says, If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art 
there. And so the destruction of hell that will come upon those that have not obeyed the gospel will be a destruction that is in the very presence of God. Hellfire, I believe, is a direct result of the presence of the Lord and his anger towards those that are deserving of it. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 22 says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn to the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundation of the mountains. God's very anger is what kindles, is what feeds, is what causes the fires and flames of hell to thrive. Hell is a place of intense sorrows. Hell is a place where destruction hath no covering. Hell is reserved for the wicked. The Bible says they shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. The Bible says let death seize upon them and them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. And these are the fallen ones that have not obeyed the gospel, that have that destruction, that flaming fire of vengeance reserved unto them, who shall be punished with everlasting destructions. David even proclaims, let death seize upon them. Let them go down quick, for wickedness is among them. The Bible describes hell as a place of pain. A place of pain that gets a hold of you. In other words, it seeks you out. It's, it desires to grab a hold of you and not let go. When those sorrows of death compassed Christ and the pains of hell got a hold of him, that was when trouble and sorrow was at its peak and at its pinnacle. And that's what's reserved to those that obey not the gospel. The Bible says of hell, it's, it and destruction are never full. And why? Because Isaiah 5 verse 14 says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and hath opened her mouth without measure. God is angry at the wicked every day. And when these wicked don't ask for forgiveness, you've got to think that his anger grows and grows and grows. And his anger is what feeds the fires of hell. And so hell is enlarging herself. Hell and destruction will never be full because the wrath of God is on the... Is, to the uttermost upon them that believe not. Hell is beneath us, and even the world will teach you that below this crust that we stand upon is hot molten rock, fire and brimstone. And it goes on forever and ever and ever seemingly. The Bible says that this is the state of the hell fire that waits those that have not submitted themselves, not believed on Jesus, not obeyed the gospel. But some will say, oh, this is just an Old Testament doctrine, right? Everything you've quoted here is simply from the Old Testament. And God now, he is nicer. He is gracious. He is more loving than to cast anyone into hell. God is, is just this wonderful pie in the sky, love only all the time kind of a God. He would never condemn somebody to hell. But Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 10 and verse 28 said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He reaffirms this when he says, Fear him, referring to God, which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Him. Jesus, when describing the offense of the sin of unbelief, or the offense of trusting in an idol, or the offense of refusing to believe the gospel, he says, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. In other words, if something that you're seeing is withholding you from believing on Christ today, pluck out that eye. If your right hand and what you are doing with it has caused you to be distracted from the promise that Jesus Christ gave that you can go to heaven when you die if you trust him, cut it off and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into hellfire. This is serious business, especially in the eyes of our Savior. This the Lord described in a story of real events a rich man that died and was buried. 
And the Bible says instantaneously, with barely a pause for breath, he says, and in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, instantly, instantaneously, and that is where he is this day, until Revelation 20, verse 13, in the, in the 13 and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to to his work. So here in the presence of God, all men come far and wide from the sea, from the mountains, from the dens and rocks of the cave. All men that have died come to be judged before in the presence of God. And the Bible says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. This is a grim picture of what happens when men are brought before the presence of a holy God. He has anger. He has wrath. He has indignation that will only be resolved when he finally takes all of his enemies and casts them into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Only then will be appeased if it is to be, as it says in verse 13, that we are to be judged solely based upon our own works. Of the presence of the Lord, the Bible says that the presence of God, the presence of the Lord, it either burns or it blesses. The reality is, is that nobody wants to take part in what I just described. Nobody wants to go to hell throughout all eternity. But the reality is, is that we all deserve it. We know that everyone would choose heaven. Everyone would say, yes, of course. I don't want to be in the presence of God and burn. I don't want to be in the presence of God and suffer. I don't want to be in the presence of God and be sorrowful forever and ever and ever until I'm eventually just cast into a lake of fire to continue in sorrow, death, condemnation, and ruin. But the reality is, is that though we all want to go to heaven, we can't make it there. There's only one way that anyone can find their way of escaping the hell that we all deserve. We need to acknowledge our sinful condition. We need to believe that Jesus Christ paid the penalty, and we need to call upon him for salvation. Who is worthy of hell? The lake of fire, the second death. The Bible says in Revelation 21 and verse 8, All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The truth is, is that many of us, and all of us, in fact, have done much worse than tell just one little lie. But it's that one little lie that is enough to condemn you to hell for all, all eternity. No matter who you are, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No matter who you are, none is righteous, no, not one. And this is the bad news that's contained in the message that Christ brought to us. He said the wages of sin is death. If you're to go and you're to, by your works, try to get to heaven, death is all you're going to receive. God, I'm working. God, I'm working. God, I'm working. God, I'm trying. He goes, death, 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 death. He keeps paying dividends in death. But if we believe that Jesus Christ paid that penalty that we deserve, if he took away that debt that we keep accumulating... The Bible says, though the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We need to understand that it is a gift. That means we can't pay for it. It's not a purchase. That means we can't work for it. Otherwise, that's a wage or a payment. The gift is something that we can't lose. In other words, if you can lose it, then you never possessed it. If you can lose it, then it was never really a gift. The Bible says that eternal life, it says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Everlasting life, eternal life never ends. If it ends, then God lied to you. If it ends, you've lost the gift. It's been taken away from you. But God doesn't lie. The Bible says, he that believeth on the Son hath life. That means present tense, have it, possess it, it's yours. He that believeth on the Son has it. There's no doubt in their mind. As sure as I'm holding this book here, I know that I have it. You can't convince me otherwise. You can know that you have eternal life. But just believing the Son, what does that mean? We need to believe the gospel. The gospel is this. 
God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth him, we know this, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the gospel message is, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and he was seen by those that testified, that those that testified, by those that testified. And as we stand here today, we received of that same message. That Jesus Christ came down to this earth because he recognized that you and I are not good enough to get to heaven. He recognized that you and I deserve death and hell throughout all eternity. But God loves you. And so he gave the greatest gift of all. He gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ, the son of God, born in the flesh of a virgin, lived a perfect life that none of us could live. To the end that we condemned him for jealousy. We condemned him for envy. Put him on a cross. Nailed him there. Let his blood drip to the ground. And there he breathed his last breath before he said, it is finished. And this is what Christ had to do in order to pay for your redemption. He took it a step further. Died on that cross. Was buried for three days and three nights. The Bible says that his soul was dipped into hell. But hell could not contain him. Neither did his flesh see corruption. And both were united. He walked the earth testifying of the fact that he himself was written by, risen by saying, Touch me. Touch me. Behold, it is I. And then he rose again and gave power unto those. And he says, And to this day cries out from heaven in love towards everybody. I want you in the presence of God. I want you in the presence of the Lord. You can't come here, but I provided the opportunity that you could. The Bible says that though our sins be as scarlet, yet they shall be white as snow. We just sang, whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanseth us from all sins. If we were to stand in the presence of God, it's burning and torment in our own state right now. But if we're to stand in the presence of God with the covering that he provided of his son's precious blood, then we can stand justified, just as if I never sinned. God's in the business of saving people. Christ Jesus came to this world to save people. But because he did that for everybody, that doesn't mean everybody's going to heaven. People need to put their faith and trust in him. And one way that we show that we've put our faith and trust in him, just as I can say, hey, this is a free gift to anybody that wants it. Who wants this today? Until somebody raises their hand and says, yeah, I want that book. Then I can go, okay, here you go. In the same way God's in heaven saying, who wants eternal life? I did everything that is needed. I paid the penalty for your sins. I died in your place. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All it takes is somebody saying, yeah, I want that free gift. Yeah, I want eternal life. Yeah, I want to go to heaven forever and ever and ever and escape the torments of hell. There's no magic words, but something like, God save me is enough from a believing and trusting heart. To have Christ Jesus go in a moment, you have eternal life. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. This means you're not trusting Jesus plus Buddha. You're not trusting Jesus plus baptism. You're not trusting Jesus plus be a good person. You are 100% trusting Jesus. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you've believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. And that's the promise of eternal life. And that's how, that's the only way, that's the only door, that's the only opportunity that somebody can stand in the presence of God and be blessed. Like I said, the presence of the Lord either burns or it blesses. The Bible says that we can, as believers, step boldly before the throne of grace. Do you understand the implications of that? The throne of grace, the mercy seat, 
was a place that was closed off to all Israel, barring one priest going in once a year, not without blood, to bring a sacrifice and atoning work for the entirety of the congregation. And yet the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, and Christ, when he died, buried, rose again, rent that in two. So now we can step in. We don't need a priest. We don't need a mediator. We can walk before the throne of grace and bring our petitions unto him. You understand that the very presence of God would destroy men before this? The very presence of God would burn men before this, and yet God says, come in boldly. Come in to my presence. Come in to the throne room of the king. What a great and wonderful day it is that we can do that now. Amen. What a great and wonderful day it will be when we can stand before him in heaven. But the really one I want to focus on is that now, in this moment, you can come to the presence of God and it will do great things for you. The presence of the Lord, as it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, offers rest. Look at verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed. And it continues. In verse 11 it says, Wherefore we also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. The Bible is saying that the presence of the Lord to the believer, now that we are covered with Jesus' blood, now that we can stand before his throne of grace, the presence of the Lord, just in this passage, offers four things. Peace, it offers prayer or provision, it offers power, and it offers purpose. See, before that, people would stand before the presence of God and they would have everlasting destruction, flaming fire, hell, the torments of it for eternity just to stand before the mighty power of God and in his presence. But now he has flipped it. He has given us access. He has given us the very blessings that he would give to his own son. Peace or rest. There's a song that says, Peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in the fathomless billows of love. And God gives us that great rest, that great peace, that overwhelming calmness. Just as Jesus uh, rebuked the wind in the great storm and tempest as it was about to take out the ships of the disciples, he, he cried peace unto it, and it was still in a moment. God gives that same peace to us. You are troubled, rest. You are troubled, be at peace. In Philippians chapter 4, in verse 6, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, the Bible says, Be careful for nothing. Be full of care for nothing. But in everything, so to the contrary, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God. So God here is giving the opportunity that rather than care, rather than worry, rather than fret, rather than be shaken, you can have peace. Because the antidote is that instead of care in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. Seek God with a thankful heart. Pray unto him for supplies. Pray unto him with your petitions. Ask him to take your cares away with a thankful heart. And the Bible says in verse 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And these are the battlefields of men. This is, where, this is where worry and care really fester in your heart and in your mind. Where you think about things, where you meditate upon things, where you worry about things. Your very desires, the thoughts and intents of your heart. Once worry gets in, will fester and rot and ruin. But God says, pray. 
God says, ask for my supply with a thankful heart and the peace that I have, the peace of God, the peace of the presence of the Lord, which passeth all understanding, which you can't even fathom, which you can't even think about, which you can't even ponder upon or pontificate about what that would mean, shall keep you, shall sustain you, shall hold you. Your hearts, your minds, through Christ Jesus. This is a great provision that God has given to those that are in his presence. But you got to be covered. You got to be saved. You got to be born again to receive of this great peace. Amen. One of the fruits of the Spirit love, joy, peace. And it comes from the Prince of Peace, the ruler of peace itself. Peace be still, he said. Prayer and provision. This alluded to it a little bit. But then the Bible says, call upon the Lord for salvation. We don't just stop there. Even as we discussed today, how you enter in through the door, and then you go back through the door and come in and come out and come in and come out. Even so, we call upon the Lord for salvation, and then call upon the Lord for sustenance, for provision, for strength, for all of your cares and all your needs. The Bible said, call upon me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You know, God doesn't even hear the prayers of the wicked. And yet he says to his own, he says to those that are blood-bought children of the king, he says, call me. I will answer and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You come to him with your problems. You call upon him. And he answers you and then shows you something you didn't even consider. He shows you great and mighty things that you didn't even know about. Great and mighty things which thou knowest not. 1 John chapter 5, in 1 John chapter 5, in 1 John chapter 5, and in verse 14, We'll go back to 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that ye have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Remember, there's the two beliefs there. It talks about believing for faith and that the salvation that he gives you, knowing that you have it, and then taking hold of the eternal life that you can live out today by doing the same and believing on him. In verse 14, it says, And this is the confidence... The confidence is faith. The confidence is hope. The confidence is a secure mind in the fact that God will perform whatsoever you ask. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. You got to know that God's hearing your voice today. You got to know that when you stand in his presence and you ask for prayer, supplication, you ask for desires, you take your cares and cast them upon his feet because he careth for you. You got to be confident, believing and trusting because not because of what I say, but because of what the Bible says that our confidence is in the fact that we have trusted him. And if we're asking according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that our petitions are already answered. It's just a matter of us exhibiting patience, exhibiting long-suffering, and waiting for the provision that will come through the prayer. The presence of God in the Christian's life brings peace. It brings provision. It also brings power. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, we were just there. But the Bible says, I can do... All things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can do all things. You go to Romans 8. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And that's the promise of the power of God from on high. To strengthen you to do what? All things. To have what? All things. To in believing faith, trust, and pray for, and receive all things. To have peace above measure because you have power from on high. It is Christ that strengtheneth us and makes us so that we are perpetually overcomers. We are constantly just growing in grace. We are constantly just feeding our faith. As the word of God sets in, we grow more and more and more. We have power from on high. 
power from the Holy Ghost. We have power from His Spirit because He promised it. I can do. This isn't the Apostle Paul boasting in himself. He didn't say, I can do all things because I'm a Pharisee. He said, I was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. I considered that all but dumb that I might have the power of Christ rest upon me. No, I can do all things through Jesus Christ, which strengtheneth me. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 33, the Bible says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God's chosen people, God's believers, God's saved, blood-bought Christians today, right? If you're covered by the blood of God, you're God's elect. If you're covered by the blood of Jesus, you are God's elect, you're his chosen people today. It is God that justifieth. Just as if you never sinned, you stand before him holy and righteous and clean, where others would be burned up the very presence that he has. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God who maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be ever to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the power that you have in Christ. Nothing can stop that. Nothing can quench that. You can do all things through Christ, and there's nothing that's going to separate you from the love of God. Stand before his presence. Go there boldly, because Christ wants you there. He loves you and gave you the power. He'll give you the peace. He'll give you the provision. All these things come because we have access to the Father, because Christ Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. His presence will give us the peace, the provision, the power, and finally the purpose. Acts chapter 1 and verse 18. The purpose. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Verse 7 says, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. That same power he's going to give to you. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye... Sound words, Baptist Church. But ye, individual under the sound of my voice, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth, and to Toronto, and to Scarborough, and to Burlington, and to Kitchener. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. God gives that power. God gives that provision. God gives that peace. God gives that purpose all because we stepped into his presence because he opened the door. We stepped into his presence because he provided a lamb. We stepped into his presence because he shed his precious blood so that we could be covered and we could go to him. And now we stand justified. Where? In his presence. Just as men will stand in his presence and be burned with an everlasting destruction and be destroyed with everlasting suffering and be condemned with everlasting condemnation and contempt, we as believers have access and stand justified in the same burning, fiery presence that Moses did when he said, I exceedingly fear and quake. And that's not going to negate the fact that you're probably going to hit the ground. But what shall be the end of those that believe not? Obeying the gospel is what gives us access. Obeying the gospel is what gives us covering. Obeying the gospel allows us into the presence of the Lord. And there, among so many other things, we'll have peace. We'll have provision. We'll have power. And we'll have purpose. Are you justified today? Can you stand before him? If not, then... You'll be destroyed. If not, destruction will come upon you. And this is the purpose that God has given us, is that if there were somebody in here, you know at this church you'd be asked, if there were somebody out in the world, you know if we come across you, we're going to come and we're going to preach that same message. The purpose that we have is to take the gospel message, know that people need it, and 
be bold enough to give it, to preach that people need to understand their sinful condition, to preach that they need to believe on Jesus and trust him alone for the salvation that he offers, and to call upon the name of the Lord. That is the purpose that all of us have been given now that we have stood in the presence of God. Way better today to stand justified than it is to stand condemned. Amen. Don't you agree? Amen. So go and tell somebody else. Go and let somebody else in. Go and show somebody else the door. Hell hath no torment. There's, the world hath no torment. A lot of people will say, you know, I'm going through so many things down here. It's such a hard life to live. You may have been through some things. You may, you may have suffered some things. People have did you wrong. You're, you're burdened. You're worn down. You're bitter against the world. And more importantly, you're bitter against God. You'll stand before his presence burned. It'll be far worse than anything you could have suffered here. But God offers that men could stand blessed in his presence if they would only believe, if they would only trust him. And Christian, today, you've known the peace that passeth all understanding. You've had the provision set upon your lap when you had nothing. You've had the power from on high to do great exploits. You've been in awe of what God has done in your life. Take the purpose that he has given you to go and share it with others and thus fulfill the commission, the command. It should be to the desire of our heart to bring more people to the presence of the Lord. Get them washed. Get them clean by the blood of Jesus that they could stand justified just like we are. And that is what it means to have the presence of God. That is why we have the presence of God. That's why we're not sitting in the presence of God now is that we could suffer, allow, bring, draw more unto him. And they could all share in it. Amen. Jesus, 